I'm just going to give you a bit of a soft tissue injury management update. So hopefully a lot of it's quite familiar, but if you have any questions, let me know. So um, there's lots and lots of soft tissue injuries, but probably sort of the major ones are ligament sprains and ruptures, muscle strains, tendon tears, contusions, bursitis. And then chronic soft tissue injuries, kind of the, certainly the most common is tendinopathies, which have lots of different uh, names depending on, on the nature of them. And so um, physiology of soft tissue healing, hopefully again this is familiar. So there's an inflammatory phase the first few days. There's a reparative phase which lasts up to about four weeks and there's a remodeling phase. That graph is quite a good way to show you that it, um, the phases overlap a lot. So it's not just as straightforward as someone's finished in their sort of proliferative phase at four weeks or anything like that. And I think the other thing about this is it does take up to six months. It's not that soft tissue injuries don't always just disappear after a few weeks. Um, so ligament injuries are really common, really common coming through orthopedics and really common coming through ED. Um, and they sort of grade them mild, moderate, severe. Mild ones hopefully uh, don't tend to come to ED too much and they're often not particularly painful and there's not any sort of big effect on the joint. Moderate tears, a partial tear of the ligament, so there's quite a few fibres torn and they have an increased laxity but there's still a firm end point. And then a grade three is a severe or a complete tear and there's lots of laxity and there's no end point. And Sometimes if they've torn the nerve endings, they're actually less painful than a lot of the grade twos. Um, so ACL ruptures, I'm just going over a couple of ones that turn up a lot in ED and orthopedics and the sports clinic. And some things that you may not know, so orth ACL ruptures we probably associate with AFL in Melbourne and all the guys, but women are up to about 10 times more likely to do their ACL. And they're mostly non-contact. Um, somewhere around 70 or 80 percent of them are non-contact injuries usually. And they almost always hear a pop and they usually have a large hemarthrosis if they've ruptured their ACL. And if you have that presentation, it's pretty much an ACL until you prove it otherwise. Um, and it's good to get them going on a, a plan pretty quickly. They're also really highly associated with lots of other injuries like MCL tears, so medial collateral ligament tears of the knee, meniscal tears and lots of other things. Um, and usually they can't wait there, they need an x-ray and that kind of stuff. If the x-ray is normal, they still need follow-up and referral. They need to see the orthopods and they also need physio because people who have good physio and are prehabilitated before they have surgery do much better after surgery if their quads are strong in particular. Yeah. There's lots of research into it and there's research into whether it's hormonal and, and it's probably related to, like, there's, there's no definite answer but it, it's probably related to the sports they do. Netball is a great one for rupturing ACLs because and they've they've adapted netball rules to try and change that because of all the sudden stops and so they're constantly landing from a jump and having if they keep going they lose the ball so um, then it, there's no point playing so netball is quite a, a problem um, and then there's lots there is I think there's little bits of evidence they've looked at whether it's related to um, menstruation and all that kind of stuff whether it's hormonal and and muscle fibers and all that kind of stuff but I don't know the definite answer, but <laughs> yeah. They all have a very small notch where the ACL attaches, um, much smaller than men. So the theory is that there's a soaring effect when the ACL is being stretched and relaxed, and that's the theory at the moment as to why women do their ACLs. And that's right, it is ten times more likely. Mm. We used to see boys coming in, boys girls, uh, young men coming in from football, but I think I see more ACLs coming into clinic now than I do in women than I do in men. Mm, yeah. Um, and ankle sprain is probably the other thing that uh, certainly keeps me in business in ED. Um, and it is the most common acute sporting trauma. 
and it's mostly inversion injuries so I'm sure you guys get lots of these as well and you can kind of grade it mild moderate severe again and an easy way is to think of oops there's uh so that's the lateral aspect and that's the medial aspect and it's pretty easy to see that the medial aspect is much stronger and thicker ligaments and the lateral aspect is uh is much more prone to injury so atfl too short to reach but <laughs> that one um is it doesn't have really high resistance to load so that's the first one to go and then severe sprains all of those three are gone um the other ones that, so people do get eversion injuries um occasionally about 20 percent of the time and the other thing which is more recognized now and it's really well recognized in rugby states is um a sort of high ankle sprains they're called so this dorsiflexion so rugby players get down and then they twist on their ankle and they get um, tears of the, the ligaments in the um, distal tibiofibular joint. And that's becoming more recognised and that's a really good one for our sports doc and to be monitored. Uh, we do get quite a few uh, referrals to ED with little avulsion fragments off the especially the lateral aspect of the ankle and they're basically soft tissue injuries and they do really well with physio management if they're just little tiny chips okay muscle injuries that's not hussy's leg that's another one i found on google but muscle injuries are really similar in with uh, uh, similar to ligaments so mild moderate severe so mild is a few fibers torn they usually they usually play on if they do that at footy or people, I mean, hamstrings, people often, if they just slip and kind of do the splits, they can do their hamstring as well. And they can usually walk about and it's not too bad if it's a grade one. If it's a grade two, they tend to have some disability. There's quite a few fibres torn and that could easily be a grade two with all that bruising. And then a severe is a complete tear. And if you're suspecting that, then they need orthos, really. The other thing is a contusion, because we do get quite a few of those through ED as well, and it's mostly people that get whacked, and it's often quads or hamstrings, because there's lots of muscle belly, and it's really well, um, it's got really good blood supply. And so it's almost always a direct blow. And if it's managed well, it's, it's really not a big deal, but Sometimes they don't. If they've just won the grand final, they often go out on the town and they, they drink and they don't ice it and then it becomes a bit of a problem. And they can be really uh, debilitating if it's not managed well and they can get myositis ossificans is probably the most common one. I haven't seen that in someone that managed it well, but I have seen it quite often in people who don't manage it well or whose trainers rub out their corky and that kind of stuff. So hopefully that's disappearing but I did hear of it last week that a guy came in so probably everyone <laughs> you might not have to go to this extreme for soft tissue management but probably everyone is familiar hopefully with that so rest and I have seen some stats that rest is the most important thing and it probably is more than three quarters of the benefit is rest out of all the soft tissue management so it's really important to Oh, I lecture the patients about that, make sure they're fully aware of it. And it's really important for them to ice. So don't need a whole body ice bath usually, just 20 minutes every couple of hours. And compression reduces the bleeding and swelling. Elevation is also good. And then referral. Soft tissue injuries um, often need follow-up unless they're those really minor grade ones. Just because there's not a fracture on the x-ray doesn't mean there's not a problem there. Um, a little bit about NSAIDs, it's become quite controversial and people may not be aware of that. So there we go. So the inflammatory process, the sort of the view now is that it's really important for damaged tissue and there's, obviously there's a risk of side effects with NSAIDs and there's some evidence that it's not really much more effective than paracetamol. 
And there's, this is mostly from animal studies, but there's a suggestion that it has an effect because you're, you're taking away the inflammatory process, you're taking away some of the foundations and things for repair. And so and this is only animal studies, and so it's still quite controversial, but um, there's a suggestion that it might affect re-injury rates and tensile strength. If things, if there's a big inflammatory process, it definitely has a good effect. So that's why it gets a bit controversial. So most authors sort of recommend to maybe leave it a couple of days before people get anti-inflammatories and maybe not for really long periods of time and you probably for other reasons you don't really want people using anti-inflammatories for really long periods of time. Um, and most authors recommend just the minimal dose and duration. So they're okay to use but maybe just be careful about um, really long periods of time. Uh, and immobilisation, so Fiona's going to talk a little bit about some fancy braces and things that we have, but we do get quite a few people that have been immobilised for really long periods of time with soft tissue injuries, like weeks. And, and even just when I was working in outpatients and private practice and things, it really takes an awfully long time for them to get better. They may need it for a short period of time, and certainly if you're suspecting fractures and stuff, there's really good reasons to immobilise it very briefly. But longer than about three days has big effects. It has big effects on the joint. It makes the joint stiff. It makes the articular cartilage um, degenerate. It, it can have the effect of osteopenia and muscle atrophy and loss of flexibility, muscle weakness, all those things. Uh, so preferably protected mobilisation. So if someone has a, an MCL sprain of their medial collateral ligament of their knee, if you use a brace like that, they can still move their knee and you sort of mitigate a lot of the, the bad effects of immobilisation, but you're still protecting the injured structure. So any time that you can do protected mobilisation is, is preferable. Um, and no harm is the other part, so I'm sure you're all familiar with no heat, alcohol, running, massage. When I just did a little bit of reading to prepare this, most of uh, what I read actually said the reason for no alcohol was more to do with the fact that people do stupid things when, um, when they've had alcohol rather than that it has a massive effect on things. So. Um, that's interesting. And I thought I'd talk a little bit just about chronic soft tissue injury because we get, as the physios with the orthopaedic clinic, we get lots of tendinopathies. Um, and tendinitis is not really accepted that much anymore as a, as a true sort of clinical entity because of, there's no inflammatory component. There is in some conditions and certainly in acute uh, sort of tendon pathology, there can be inflammation and some rheumatological things. But tendinopathy for most of the stuff that you see is chronic soft tissue, which has three stages. So there's a re reactive tendinopathy, which is mostly due to compression of the tendon in some form. And the tendon's just swollen at that stage, but invest ultrasound has often got a swollen tendon, but MRI might be normal. And then the second stage is tendon disrepair, so the collagen starts to get a bit disorganised, basically, and you definitely see that on ultrasound and that kind of stuff. And then the third stage is degeneration, so that's neovascularisation of the tendon, showing all those sort of hot spots. Uh, it's hard to reverse degenerative tendinopathies, almost impossible, they sort of say, but if you get it in the earlier stages, you can actually do stuff about it. So this, and I do have handouts for you so that this is on it, is a tendon pathology continuum. So if you catch them at these stages, particularly at this stage, and you modify their load and, and manage it well, they often don't progress to the later stages. So that's hopefully what we can catch early would be great. And so depends. the treatment is really different depending on where they are in that stage of the continuum. And it's, the main thing is managing the load. If you really offload tendons, then they don't react well. But if you really load them up, they don't react well either. And so um, appropriate eccentric exercise definitely changes the disorganization of the collagen. 
and uh, decreases the vascularity. There's decent evidence to suggest that. There's some suggestion that ibuprofen is good, but other anti-inflammatories affect the tendon repair. So perhaps if you have patients, consider ibuprofen. And there's new, there's lots of different injections of written PRP, but there's lots of different things being tried. There's not high level evidence, but there's definitely people very excited about PRP injections as a treatment for tendinopathies. So it's worth considering a referral to sports med or someone that would like to do that. And physios, you don't need to recognise the stage of the tendon pathology or manage the load, but physios can do that for you. And if you get them early, like I said, then it makes a really big difference to the outcome for that person. Um, and I've, there's some resources there, so if you need to find physios, the Australian Physio Association has a website which has a find a physio feature, that big arrow there, so you can type in a postcode and how far away or a suburb and it'll find physios for you. Sports Med Australia has lots of good soft tissue stuff on their website, fact sheets for patients and information for clinicians. And we use in ED the fact sheets a lot as well. The Department of Health has got a whole bunch of fact sheets and there's general soft tissue ones and there's specific ones for knee injuries and ankle injuries and that kind of stuff. And they're free on the web for everybody. Uh, most of my talk is based on Bruckner and Kahn. You might be familiar with it. It's a fantastic book. The fourth edition is about a year old now and it's about 100 bucks on Amazon and it's a great resource for differential diagnosis of soft tissue injuries and um, it's got lots of management in it as well. And then that's the tendon reference. Any questions about anything else particularly? Any particular soft tissue injuries or anything like that?